And so we actually have to feed our healthy gut bacteria, which we call, you know, the bacteria, we call them probiotics of your, they digest it. And then they release these metabolites, short chain fatty acids that get into our bloodstream. We can measure these things. And that's where metabolism comes in because that is also, perhaps you'll also resonate with me on this. Um, I know as a fellow healthcare provider is that great, uh, uh, kind of gateway to walk through to talk about a lot of exciting things. <clears throat> Look, microbiome is now um, kind of a, I wouldn't even say it's a buzzword. It's part of the vocabulary of health. And, and it's a good thing too, because as a scientist uh, and as a physician, <clears throat> you know, I think that it's really important and exciting to see when new discoveries become part of the mainstream of thinking and of conversation. And it's really from that point of view, I, I want to just give a couple of examples of how important the gut microbiome is. <clears throat> so, for example, in 2017, I was I helped to organize a conference in Paris uh, um, uh, about cancer. And we wanted to bring together, it was a cancer meeting in which we didn't allow you to talk about chemo and didn't allow you to talk about newfangled therapies. And, and so when you remove all that from a credible cancer conference, what do you got? You got mental health, you've got um, a, a diet, you've got exercise, <clears throat> all the things that are important to patients. Well, enter the microbiome. And uh, there was at the time a research uh, uh, study that was about to be published the next week. And so it was under embargo and embargo just means kind of like under wraps. It was kind of a secret, but we were able to share that information. And it and the thing, the most stunning thing that I learned that day was the importance of your healthy gut and whether you're going to respond to cancer treatment or die. And I, the, to me, as a researcher, it like stunned me that the difference in 200 people who were being who are getting state-of-the-art cancer treatments of different cancer types, that whether they actually made it or didn't make it, whether they responded to treatment or where they didn't respond to treatment, relied on, in that research study, one bacteria, which everybody now talks about called Ackermansia. And this was published in the journal Science, which is one of the most credible journals out there, came out a week later. And I literally said, OMG, this is like proof of principle, how important gut health is. You know, I don't really care if you've got irritable bowel, if you've got all these other things with gut health and you want better body shape, body, body composition. But when it comes down to the black and white of cancer, which every, it affects everyone, including myself, my mom had cancer, my, 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 my two uncles died of cancer. The reality is, is that like you pay riveting attention to it. Now, fast forward to just a couple of months ago, another study came out that um, again, opened my mind yet again to the importance of the gut microbiome. And I hope I'm getting, I'm hoping I'm, I'm getting people's attention talking about this as just the intro to dive into gut microbiome and metabolism. But here's a recent study that looked at a bacteria um, uh, that uh, uh, is called PS128. It's a kind of lactobacillus and um, it was studied in Parkinson's disease. Now we don't really have good treatments for Parkinson's disease. Um, and the treatments we do have actually either don't work very well or, <clears throat> or they have side effects, some bad ones, some serious ones. And you know everyone knows the work of Michael J. Fox and the tremendous effort that's been gone, that's been invested to uh, find better treatments. Well, enter the gut microbiome. This one bacteria, which can come in as a probiotic, PS128, seems to be able to lower the symptoms of Parkinson's disease as an intervention. And I looked at it again, you know, published in a real journal, like a serious journal to go, wow, this is like confirmation <clears throat> that, you know, that, that our, the health of our gut makes a huge difference in terms of our health. So if I haven't gotten their attention yet, I'm talking about the gut microbiome, healthy bacteria. I'm talking about life or death with cancer. And I'm talking about a neurodegenerative treat, a, a disease that up until now, we didn't think there was really much of a path forward 
and 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 addressing our gut health makes a difference. And so this is actually the reason why I'm passionate to talk about this subject with you as a, you know, to kind of get into the material. What I found really interesting about this keystone bacteria is that it is not just important for the mucin lining, so the lining of that small intestine, but it's also implicated in things like our endogenous production of GLP-1. So, but understanding that by supporting particular keystone bacteria, we can also then support these bacteria and have them work more effectively. Have you found that there are specific foods that are tied to the supporting the microbiome in a in much more profound and beneficial ways than others? I would imagine things like fermented foods, et cetera, would be a benefit, polyphenol yeah. rich foods. Um, uh, now let's talk about foods that actually can help the microbiome because, you know, the, the measuring your microbiome is the first step to knowing what you need to do, just like the blood test, right? Doctor or nurse, I'm feeling a little weak. Let's draw some blood. Let's see, are you anemic? Is your blood count low? If so, what can we do with nutrition? What do we, do we need to give you a blood transfusion to tank you up? You know, these are, this is part of the modern vocabulary with the microbiome is we have to measure first to know where we are, and then we can actually make a decision about it. So one thing I would actually just communicate about uh, first, since we're talking about the measurements first uh, and, and the diseases as well, is before you just jump around and start buying probiotics, because this is where people get confused. I would say if you have a serious interest in your own gut health, go ahead and get it measured. Check it out. Ask your doctor, a gastroenterologist should be able to do it, or do research online and find a place that is well-reviewed and credible. As I mentioned, I use Sun Genomics, but there are many others, and get it measured. Know where you stand. All right. That's the first thing. If you're going to sell, if you know, if you're, to, if you're going to figure out what you need to do to sell your house, right? Get it appraised. Take a look at what you need to do before you actually invest any money in. That's my recommendation. In, in order to be able to address problems if, and then also to know where you're good because you're probably going to be good in some areas, get credit for the things you've already done before you start reaching for the stars, okay? Now, having said that, let's talk about food because the things that we can do every single day with or without a, a, a microbiome test, like, I, I, you know, I... I I appreciate when people are biohackers and they want to know everything about themselves. But many people, myself included, you know, like I, I don't need to know what's happening every second. Okay. Um, uh, but I do want to do things that are good for me on a regular basis. And this is where food comes in. So if you want good gut health and good metabolism uh, with good gut health, you want to eat foods that are um, uh, either giving you healthy bacteria and you get fermented foods. So what are some fermented foods that are you can get in any grocery store these days? Yogurt, okay, and I wanna come back to yogurt in a second. Um, you can get kefir, which is a kind of a fermented um, uh, uh, dairy product. You can uh, uh, get uh, sauerkraut, uh, you can get, which is fermented. You can get kimchi. In a lot of places now, they'll have jars of kimchi. Um, or you can certainly go to an Asian market to get, get kimchi. Um, those are all really, really good for uh, because they contain natural bacteria. Now, I know this might sound a little controversial, but because I talked about yogurt, which is a dairy product, let me talk about cheese. Because what researchers are finding that is quite surprising is that um, the uh, epidemiological studies are showing that cheese isn't as heart harmful as we used to think it is. In fact, it's actually pretty good. There have been studies that have shown eating cheese can actually lower the risk of cardiovascular disease. Well, that on the surface didn't make sense until we're now beginning to rethink the fact that most cheeses are fermented dairy products and fermented with bacteria. They are probiotic foods. And in fact, we know that camembert we know that Parmigiano Reggiano, the Italian stuff, the good stuff, you know, they're fermented with lactobacillus and other types of bacteria. The mold in a cheese that goes in a cheese cave, the blue, the blue cheese, the, the taste, the wonderful taste if you like cheeses, that's all because it's been fermented. Okay, when you eat cheese, you're seeding your own gut with healthy gut bacteria. 
All right. Um, and amazingly enough, when cheese makers over thousands of years have figured out how to do this, um, they figured out how that the good bacteria in using the cheese making process out compete, get rid of all the bad bacteria, more good than bad. There's no drug dealers in the neighborhood. There's only good citizens in the neighborhood. And yes, you do want to be careful about eating too much cheese. I'm not endorsing or telling people to eat cheese. I'm just telling you. It's another product that's actually got probiotic properties to it. Okay. Um, and for, oh, by the way, just to also bring it down to, to reality. Like people go, well, you know, like where is it in my guts? Under my stomach? Is it in my esophagus? Where is it? Our, most of our healthy gut bacteria lives in our colon. And if you're above 50, you should have had a colonoscopy and in a colonoscopy. And so we actually have to feed our healthy gut bacteria which we call, you know, the bacteria, we call them probiotics if you're ingesting them. Okay. Probiotic foods like sauerkraut, kimchi. For your gut microbiome, we give them prebiotics. Prebiotics are the food for our gut bacteria. Now, how do, what are the prebiotics that you want to eat? Well, listen, almost everything you've heard about going to the produce section and eating the rainbow, colorful foods, the brassica, the green, the broccoli, the Brussels sprouts, the the bok choy, the uh, radicchio, the bell, yellow bell pepper, the green bell pepper, and the mushrooms, and all these other things that you find in the produce section, they all contain natural substances called bioactives. Yes, they used to be famous because people tagged them as antioxidants. Now we're beginning to have a much more sophisticated view. They do a lot of different things. One of the things many of these bioactives, natural chemicals in the foods in the produce section, plant-based foods, they, they are prebiotics. They feed our gut bacteria. So when we eat a salad or a bean uh, uh, stew, or um, uh, we uh, 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 create a, a pesto, all right? When we're eating that stuff, we're of course enjoying the taste and we're absorbing the mi micronutrients and of course, those bioactives are good for our health defenses and good for our metabolism, but some of that gets tumbled on down below to your gut. And before you poop it out, okay, um, your gut, it feeds your gut bacteria. And that gut bacteria takes their food and they metabolize the food that we ate for ourselves, that they eat, and they create from the food that we feed them wonderful, healthful metabolites, other other natural chemicals called short chain fatty acids. And so that that neighborhood of healthy bacteria in our gut, they 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 eat dinner time, lunch time, they num they 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 nibble on the stuff, they digest it, and then they release these metabolites, short chain fatty acids, that get into our bloodstream. We can measure these things. And when they get into our bloodstream, they go to our brain, they go to our heart, they go to our muscles, they go to our body fat, um, they go to our kidneys, and those short-chain fatty acids improve our overall health and mental well-being. That gut-brain axis is real. The gut metabolism axis is real. So this is actually part of the new teaching that in the future, if you're going to go to medical school, nursing school, nutrition school, this is going to be part of the first year curriculum because it's the basics. Breakfast, lunch, dinner, you're not deciding for one. You know how pregnant moms say like, I'm eating for two, right? Well, now you're eating actually for 39 trillion plus yourself. And so we all carry a great responsibility when we make a decision about what we're going to eat to make sure we're also feeding our gut bacteria properly. So what are some of the things that damage our gut bacteria? Because I know everyone always says that, like, what, what do I need to stay away from? So, okay, um, uh, let me tell you that um, eating a lot of added sugar in your foods damages your gut microbiome. We don't know exactly how or why. And many things that have a lot of added sugar also have a lot of other artificial uh, chemicals, preservatives, colorings, flavoring. So maybe it's also not just the sugar, but the other stuff in these ultra processed foods. So you want to cut down or cut out your ultra processed foods. You want to optimize your gut health, try to eat whole natural foods that are fresh. Now, when I say fresh and I say whole, I don't mean that you have to just eat at the salad bar because as it turns out, when you go to the grocery store, some of the healthiest foods for our gut are actually found in the middle aisle. 
So if you actually look for beans, you know, canned beans are also really good. Dried beans are also also really good. Whole grain um, uh, uh, foods also really good. And so, um, and by the way, dark chocolate, eighty percent cacao as well, also good for the gut microbiome. Coffee, tea, things you would go into the middle aisle. Those have been shown to actually be beneficial for our gut microbiome. Tree nuts, you know the bulk nuts you go to in the grocery store. And you're like seeing these big plastic canisters with a shovel below it. And like, you're like, I don't know what I, I don't know what the heck I would do with that if I got stuff. Well, listen, here's what you want to do. That is gut microbiome food. And so what I tell people to do is take a little tub, you know, the smaller tub. Don't buy a lot. This is, you don't have to go to the big box stores. Buy enough um, uh, in a little plastic tub and get a mix of the nuts, the tree nuts you like macadamia, cashew, pecan, almonds, walnuts, you know, um, and mix them up, buy it up and then bring it home. And, and like, that's much better than buying the pre-seasoned nuclear colored stuff that you have to rip out of a bag that might taste great, but it has a lot of chemicals in it. Buy the fresh stuff. Listen, what did we all come out of around the world as humans, you know, like four years ago, uh, is the great pandemic thing. Um, that made everybody realize how important our immune system is, if nothing else. Okay. We all immune system suddenly like became another part of our vocabulary. Look, forget about the pandemic. Let's talk about the common cold. Let's talk about the flu. All right. Uh, nobody wants to get sick. You want a good, strong, healthy immune system. Your gut microbiome, healthy gut bacteria live inside the tube of the gut. Okay. They're inside the garden hose of your, of your gut. Our immune system, 70% of our immune system is found inside the wall of our gut, 70, all right? That's not what they taught me in medical school, but that's actually the case. And so our gut bacteria talk directly to our immune system and, and a good, healthy bacteria system, good microbiome means a good, healthy immune system. And so if you want to be just generally immune healthier, uh, uh, make sure your gut is healthy as well. Again, we're beginning to discover why the old adage of, you know, eating whole, uh, fresh plant-based foods, you know, and, and some of the dried ones as well are good. And some of the canned ones are good. Um, is actually better for our health. It, a lot of it has to do with our gut microbiome. There's so many other reasons as well, but because the microbiome has become part of the modern conversation, the lexicon, I think it's important to point out that this is not difficult it's pretty easy because the foods that are good for our gut are all around us. Well, you know, as a fellow healthcare provider by background, one of the things that I, I'm sure you can relate to is that we are trained in our education to really memorize certain aspects of science that get really applicable in um, treatment of disease, but not so much for prevention. And yet, you know, as we go on, we start to open our eyes to the fact that many of these diseases could be prevented in the first place. So as a scientist, as a doctor, as somebody who's, you know, had a career as a communicator, I, my first book was really about unpacking the secrets of the body that protect our health. That's something I spent, you know, 20 years helping to develop, actually develop treatments to chase those diseases until I realized we should be preventing them in the first place. When I finished my first book, I really felt like there was a story that still was untold. And that untold story was not just about how do you protect your health, but how do you optimize it from wherever you are? And that's where metabolism comes in, because that is also, perhaps you'll also resonate with me on this, um, and as a fellow healthcare provider, is that, you know, I think uh, most doctors and nurses can talk about metabolism but not so differently than how the average person can talk about metabolism who doesn't have a medical background either. We all make certain assumptions that seem like they should be true, but may not actually be true. So I decided to write a sequel. And that sequel is called Eat to Beat Your Diet, which is a trick title because it's not a diet book. It's an anti-diet book. And what it really talks about is what I'm now really passionate about, which is that if you really understand how your body works, we are all hardwired with a metabolism that serves us our entire lives. And what happens over the course of everyday existence for most of us is that we wind up actually crushing and derailing 
and actually injuring our hardwired metabolism. And then people wind up throwing up their hands saying, I don't know what to do now. And this book is really about the um, what is actually happening in your body, how should it actually operate, and how can we actually make steps to restore it back to its hardwired level? 